We are so glad you're here today. Deuteronomy chapter 7 is our bedrock text, and I'll be looking for a moment just before you're seated, Joshua chapter 3. I'll try to read this so you can be seated and not preach too much between each verse. I know you'll need to be seated because you'll be so overwhelmed and excited that you'll be standing soon with complete enthusiasm for the victory God's given you. Has God been good to you? Amen. You know, that's just what you've got to come to. What kind of God are you serving? Deuteronomy chapter 7, when the Lord God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Zebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you and when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. Hallelujah. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. In other words, today in 2013, Christians only date, court, talk to, and ultimately marry other Christians. If you are talking to, flirting with, uh, dating a sinner, stop. Amen. I commend you. Oh, I wonder how we missed him so much. <laughs> Why did we miss him? You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images and burn their carved images with fire. Mess things up. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself a special treasure above all peoples on the face of the earth. He did not set his love on you nor choose you because you are great in number more than other people, for you are the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he will keep his oath with you that he swore to the forefathers, he has brought you out with a mighty hand and he has redeemed you from the house of bondage and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Everybody give the Lord praise about that. Hallelujah. Before I draw your attention to Joshua, I want to hop back up here to verse 4. But you shall deal with them. Now, while I was gone, the Lord put some things into my heart that I should deal with. Today, we're going to deal with some things. Is that all right? I said, is that all right? We're going to, deal. We're going to call some things out. We're going to bring them to the surface. And we're going to flat deal with them. We're going to put an old-fashioned smackdown, beatdown on them. Amen. We're going to deal with them. We're going to put them in their place. We're going to deal with them. You know, I would act up. I would act up at church. And my dad was pastor, and that's not ever a good idea. But I'd act up, and he would say, I'm going to deal with you later. Soon we get to the house, I'm dealing with you. Come on, somebody. How many know we got to say to our enemy, I'm going to deal with you. Today, is, yeah, I, today you're going to get your comeuppance. I'm going to deal with you. Joshua chapter 3. Woo! Wow, I haven't preached for a long time. Woo, hallelujah. You're going to be seated. In Joshua, in just a moment. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 10. Interesting enough, again, to a new generation God says, but this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out before you. And watch this. Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, and the Zebusites, all of which are parasites. The same enemy that God spoke to Moses about, now he's speaking to Joshua about. I'm going to preach uh, today and next Sunday on this theme, driving out the enemy. Driving out the enemy. You all, along with me, have enemies. And there's only one way to treat an enemy, is that is to drive him out. Hallelujah. Somebody shout unto God if you're excited about being here today. Oh, Hallelujah.
Lift your hands with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do confirm today that you are in this holy place. We say in the name above all names that you are lifted up high and exalted and that the name of Jesus prevails over every dark force, over every enemy. Hallelujah. Now, God, today I come, I come with a fresh anointing to say to God's people, the enemy will flee. The enemy will flee. Hallelujah. And we give you praise. Let God arise and let the enemy be be scattered. Hallelujah. We are will confuse and confound and defeat the enemy today. Come on now. I want everybody, if you believe that that enemy must be destroyed, he must be driven out, you can be free from him. I want to pronounce and prophesy you can be free from these spirits. You can be free from these torments. You can, every man, woman, boy, and girl, under the sound of my voice, I announce in authority today. You need to hear me. You can be free. You can be free. You can be liberated. You can be delivered. Delivered in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. If you wish to be, do you want to be is my question. Oh, God, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. You are a mighty God. Hallelujah. We choose to believe your word. Well, you've been, you've been ready to be seated. The only ones who can be seated are those who are going to bring the heat. All the boring ones, all the quiet ones, remain standing and get your double tithe out. Oh, I see how it works. I should have thought that plan 25 years ago. Where was I? There are some enemies that you and I will ultimately and always face. And they will return and they will come back and they will try to confront. But let me tell you something about defeating an enemy. There is some absolute confidence that gains into your life. There are some things that happen into you when you know you have faced down that enemy and you have conquered. Now, he may try to rear his ugly head on occasion. There may be people in this place that you know what it's like to face severe, severe problems in your life. You've gone through a tormenting time, and you have faced that enemy, and he will try to return. But the confidence that you have gained, let me make this very clear, and I want you who are writing notes, and I want you taking this in your spirit. You and I want to defeat the enemies, and that's why we have enemies. But there is a necessity. Watch this. There's something necessary. There's something needed. And there's value. You don't, you don't, you don't think about this. But there's value. There's necessity in having an enemy. Your enemy, did you know that? I know some of us never want to have enemies at all. We want everybody to love us. But if you do what that banner behind me says... I promise you, not everybody will be your fry in. Come on now. Not everybody will approve of you. Now, they'll like you as long as you agree with them, as long as you give them their way, as long as you coexist with them and act like everybody's fine. But the minute you stand and say, you know what? I love you, but I'm not tolerating that. I'm not going to have that going in my life. I am not going to allow that influence over me. I'm going to take a stand. I promise you the day you take a stand is the day you have an enemy. Am I preaching the truth? And so an enemy reminds us whose side we're on. There is a necessity of an enemy. You've got to have enemies. Let me make this very clear. Jesus had enemies. He still does. When Jesus came and died on the cross and he came and delivered people, I mean, there were some angry folks. They tried to kill Jesus many times. They tried to take him out. The apostle Paul had enemies. All of the disciples had enemies. Many of them martyred for the cause of Christ. When you stand on one side of the cross and the enemies of that cross on the other side, you cannot always think you're going to get along. It's not, re- it's not real. It's not realistic not to have enemies and this is more true in the spirit world than in any other world at all you and i in the spirit realm and god's kingdom face enemies on a daily basis how many could agree with that you and i can't have this 
confusion that somehow we think because I'm serving God and because I'm in God's will because I love the Lord with all my heart somehow I'll be rescued somehow I'll be spared somehow I'll be delivered the pressure of an enemy but sickness and disease and poverty and death and all those things will continue to come Paul writes this all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution I'm not worried about you if you're suffering persecution because you're standing for Jesus. I'm going to worry about you if you don't. If you live life unscathed, if you live life without any problems, without any wounds, without any battle scars, perhaps that means you don't have an enemy. You're not a threat to your enemy. But the greatest compliment that the devil can give you, how many know the devil is not a nice guy, but he gives compliments? The compliment is when he comes to attack you. Why is he attacking you? Because he's worried about you. You got him back on his heels. You ought to give the Lord a praise about that truth right now. Oh, the devil attacks, and we're glad about it because greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. Now, I found it interesting that the promise is in Psalms. It's in Psalms 63 and 1, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. And in Deuteronomy here, though the enemy comes in, when the enemy comes in one way, he will flee seven ways. What that means is we have the enemy attacking us, and we have the power of God not only to smite him down, but to confuse him and to tor torment him and to divide him and to send him scattered on his way. The enemy comes in against us, and we have the power to smite down that enemy. Listen, when demons come against you, if you go ahead and you come against them and you retaliate with power and force in the name of Jesus, you weaken their strongholds, not only your life, but you weaken the strongholds on the people you love because you have divided the enemy. You have smite down that enemy, and he has come in one way, but you have confused him. No wonder we read, let God arise and let the enemy be scattered. Let God arise. Let him be lifted up. Some of you today, you got to get out of that thing that praise is a problem. That worship is... Oh, uh, something they're trying to make me do. Our uh, worship is, you know, trying. No, praise and worship not only blesses God and not only is mandatory, but it confuses your enemy right in the face of your enemy. David experienced, he said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy and my cup runneth over right in the face of your enemy you begin to enjoy at the table of the Lord in sweetest affairs hallelujah and you begin to taste and see that the Lord is good don't you know that confuses and scatters and torments the enemy hallelujah right, let me ask you this has the enemy ever tormented you Come on, what goes around comes around. Isn't paid back at what we need to give him? We need to come back and say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Every time the enemy's tormented me, I'm going to torment him through the weapon of praise. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Let me tell you real quick about the, the service we were at last Sunday. It was a great service, a multicultural church of all nations. Of course, it was down in Florida. And... Um, it was a, a lot of wonderful different nations, probably 30, 40 different nationalities. It was a really wonderful time. And I, I really got a lot out of the preaching. And I was kind of, you know, I was telling our deacons sometimes in, in 2013, what's popular and what's in vogue for pastors is to be overly um, syrupy and overly sweet. And how many know I didn't take that class? Come on. <laughs> And just, you know, always talking about, and it sounds, it's like the same thing I hear all the time. How wonderful, how sweet, how precious, how special. You're God's people, and be positive and all that. And, you know, I was kind of leery because I'm thinking, okay, if, is Lighthouse the only church that I know going on today? I know there's a few others. But do I have to go home to hear some strong preaching is what I'm thinking. Because I, I like me some good, hot, strong preaching with a little gravy on it. I ain't going to lie. And... This guy preached a lot like me, less the gravy. He didn't have a lot of gravy, but, um, but he wore a suit and tie. I thought, well, hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. Well, glory be to God. And you know what he did? He said, you all ain't, ain't amen good enough. I said, well, hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. He said, could you give me a real amen? And he, and he said things like, that's good preaching if I have to say so myself. I thought, you have been watching me preach on DVD. Come on now. But I'm excited to announce to you, I'm excited to announce to you that God has brought me back. 
Randy, with a fresh word, and I am com committed to tell you that there is no enemy in hell. There is no weapon formed against you can prosper. Though the enemy come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. You are mightier than the devil. I wish to put this in your spirit and deposit this reality that you are covered by the blood of Jesus. You're washed, sanctified, justified, blood bought, and you are greater. You are mightier than the devil. And when he comes in one way, he will leave out seven ways. Hallelujah. Woo. Woo. Hallelujah. I'm excited to report to you that God is still on his throne. He is not intimidated by culture. He's not intimidated by our government, where government continues or shuts down. Sometimes I wish it would shut down, except I know people who miss their paychecks. But I'm... Did it shut down? Not yet. Let me, let me promise you, God ain't going to shut down. The kingdom of heaven ain't going to shut down. And wherever you get your check from, if you're a tither, you won't shut down. That's great preaching right there, if I may say so myself. I'll tell you, wherever you get your check from, doesn't matter because God's your source. God is your source. God is the one who owns your life. And God will provide and he will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So don't you fret. Don't you worry what culture does, what government does, what, the, what Wall Street does. Don't you worry about what people are saying because God is on his throne and God is on, in control and God is on it. God's got this. God is a mighty, wonderful God and he will not let his people fail. We read it in Deuteronomy. He says, I set, I set my love on you. I have chosen you to be a people unto myself. Therefore, it is my command to you that whenever you go to claim your promise. Now watch this. There was a promised land that was theirs. The nation of Israel, the land of Israel, that beautiful corner of the world, that, 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 that place of the world. Where God said, my people, my people shall dwell and own. It is still that little bitty nation is still the number one source of contention in all the world still today. People are still threatening it. People are still threatened by it. There are people divided about it. There are people whose families are divided about it. Why? Because it belongs to God's people, and God always said it will be yours, and it shall be theirs. Hallelujah. And we are the people of God, and just like he gave a promised land called Israel to those slaves in Egypt, he gave you and I a promised Simon land. Hallelujah. But here's the, here's the thing. If, if, if there is a promise, there must be a fight. Mm. If, there, whoo, if there is a promise, there must be a battle if there is a promise to claim there must be a war to be won hallelujah and so and so uh, 430 years there in Egypt along comes these other people these other nations and guess what they start doing they start occupying God's promised land what did Joshua and Caleb say all the land that you have sent us to occupy is a land that flows with milk and honey here's the fruit thereof of it but he said, there are giants tonight, the ten spies said. Uh, there are giants in the land. There are giants there we cannot possess. Why? Because while God's people were in bondage in, his, in, in Egypt, over in Israel, there were nations being built. The Hittites, the Zebusites, the Canaanites, they were all coming in, and they were building their cities. They were building their lands. They had commerce. They had economy. They were running business. They were having trade. They were building waterways, and they were building uh, farms and lands and vineyards and business and raising their children, educating their families. They, they acted like God's land was now their land, but they didn't have the rights to it. They didn't have the deed to it. God held a mortgage on it because it was not set up for them. It was set up for God's people. Now watch this. There are some promises. You need to hear this pastor tell you. There are some promises for your family. There are some promises for your life. And there is an enemy has moved in and he has occupied your promised land. He, oh, he has occupied your promise. But I read over in Hebrews chapter 11 that these people of faith obtain promises. Now watch this. How many could raise your hand and say, I know I have promises in God's word that are yes and amen. I know that God has promised me certain things. Come on, put your hand up. I know that God has promised me a certain kind of life, a certain level of victory. Well, knowing there's a promise and enjoying the promise are two different things. Come on, somebody. I'll illustrate it this way. Let's say behind that door is a $10 million gift for somebody. And I've told you, I said, who would like, anybody here could use that? Let me Okay, 
All right, okay. So let's say, Dwayne, let's say, Dwayne, you, you don't have to go anywhere, but could you use it? Yeah. So let's say, Dwayne, Dwayne, I, I have a promise for you. I've seen it. It's real. It's right there. It's a pile of money. They brought it in on a forklift. It's on a skid. It's wrapped up, and there's $10 million. And the name on it is Dwayne Harder. That's you. Now, Dwayne could sit there all day and sing songs about that promise. I've got a promise. $10 million is mine. Woo -hoo. Then dance and praise the Lord. And he could write letters. And he could go on, online, he could tell his friends, I want to tell you something about my promise. I've got the greatest promise in the world. I've got a promise behind the door at the church. They brought in a forklift. Let's get it. It's all wrapped up. It has my name on it. It's Dwayne Hart, $2 million. He can go tell his friends, his family. He can sing songs about it, write songs about it. He could write words about it. He could write a book about it. He could just build buildings that talk about it. Let's all gather and rejoice on Dwayne's promise. Let's rejoice. But let me tell you something. There's going to be a time he gets weary of talking about, singing about, thinking about, dwelling about the promise. He's going to have to get up and go knock down a door and get in and claim his promise. Now, I'm telling you, between that door and between him, there are a whole lot of enemies. They probably look like you and me because we want to fight him for his promise. But if he really wants that promise, he'll, he'll have to stop singing about it and talking about it. He'll have to get up and he'll have to do some fighting. Now, all God says is, if you'll start fighting, you will win. But you have to do a little fighting and get that promise. I'm guaranteed you, I'm guaranteed you, you'll win if you'll fight. But you can't win unless you fight. And am I preaching good to somebody else this morning? Well, I promise you today that there is a life for you. There is a promise for you that you got to quit talking about and you got to obtain it. You got to take the journey from there to there and go claim your promise. Jump to your feet if you're glad this is good preaching in your heart today. You got to move in. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Give the Lord a shout of victory. Woo! Oh, yes, Lord. So between, between your promise and obtaining your promise and knowing your promise stands the enemy. Now, these nations that I've read today were specific people's groups. Now, these nations are long since gone. They're no longer the threat. But what these nations represent, can I have a little more microphone? <clears throat> I preached for a while. I'm about to preach myself out of a voice. And the good news is I'm just getting started. <clears throat> oh, that's good news. <laughs> that's not bad news. Because some of you are just putting up with the enemy. And you're living with the enemy. And you know that crazy bumper sticker that says coexist? That new age hooey? Heck, we are coexisting. I ain't killed anybody. But I promise you this much, it coexisting means that I put every other kind of religion in the same line with Jesus, I'm not going to coexist because Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way to get to God but by Jesus. So I'm going to stand for the cross. I'm going to stand for Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed of Christ. And, I, you know, I love everybody, but that doesn't mean everybody's do, doing it right. Come on now. And so... So, so we, we just got to make up in our minds that we're just not going to coexist with the devil. We're not going to coexist with his spirit. Now, I studied and researched out these nations, and I was intrigued and very much put in a place of awe when I started understanding their names. And what I want to do today and next Sunday is to break down the reality that these nations, these real peoples, have long since gone off the earth, but their spirit is still alive and well, and is still threatening every child of God. I'd like for you, really, if you can, to take note and to write down what these nations mean. So, so Moses wrote about them. Joshua wrote about them. The same nations intrigued me. Here's what the first one means. The first one is Canaanite, the nation of Canaan. What that name means is it means bowed down. It means to dwell in low places. It means to be, watch this, depressed. Wow. And Kathy and I are very much concerned when our great church we see them, and I'm talking about clinical depression where you need to visit your doctor, but I'm talking about that spiritual, that spiritual low place. Do you know what I'm talking about, anybody? I said, do you know what I'm talking about, somebody? 
where you're on the bottom. Come on now. Have you ever felt like to reach the bottom, I'll have to lift up. Come on, I'll have to reach up. I'm below low. It's, let me just make this very clear. When you are discouraged and when you are depressed and when you are spiritually depressed and when you are despondent and when you are in despair and when you feel like um, all hope is gone and I'm, I'm down in the valley, the valley is so low. Come on now. Hang your head over. You all forgot how to help me sing? I said, hang your head over. Oh, how many do not know that song? <laughs> Have you ever watched Andy Griffin? Was it Griffin or Griffith? Griffin. <laughs> now watch this. The song said, down in the valley, the valley is low. Hang your head over, hear the wind blow. Uh, that, that's, anyhow, that's, Mary, you know it. Us kids know it. Come on now. But when you're down in the valley, Pastor Dylan, when you're down in the valley, Megan, when you're down in the valley, when you're low, that doesn't mean that God has forsaken you. And it doesn't mean you have forsaken God. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're a bad Christian. What it means is that life got to you. Come on now. A whole lot of life has happened. And circumstances and the cares and the weight and the burden, what's going to be so great about heaven is Jesus there. But when Jesus is there and when his peace is there, you're not going to have any burdens. You will be burdenless. You will have no yoke. You will have no torment of your mind. Your mind, your mind, will, be, your mind will be at ease. And this is why our deacons said to us, please be gone longer than a week. Please take several, several weeks, two and a half weeks off because they know that the first week I'm still in the, it's true. I thought about everything about the church for that first week. I could not. I tried. So don't think about the church. Don't think about them. Don't worry about them. Don't think about them. Don't worry. I tried my best for that first week. But when that second week come along, I was able to, I was able to get some rest and get some peace. How many know you just need to get some rest and peace? Some of you need to do yourself a favor. Take a little trip. Take a little vacation. And if you can't afford that, take a little nap. They're not like good old-fashioned nap. I'm planning on one today. I'm prophesying. Hallelujah. Because you know when you get back on vacation, you're tired. Come on. And after all that rest, you need some rest. Come on, somebody. But when heaven happens, and I wish you'd hear me, you're not going to be worried about oh, anything. You and I can't comprehend that. Our finite minds can't wrap around that. But when you get to heaven, you're not going to be thinking about anything that would ever bring you down. There'll be no bills. There'll be no government except the supreme government of God on his throne. There's going to be no Democrats, Republicans. There's going to be no Congress, Senate, vote. There ain't going to be no White House except if your mansion happens to be white. But we won't be calling it the White House because we'll, we'll have, you know, bad memories about that. But <laughs> Oh, I'm being funny. Hallelujah. But there's going to be, listen. You're not going to be in heaven and say, oh, man, I forgot to shut the stove off. Oh, man, I forgot to let the dog out because your dog won't need to let out because your dog, if your dog is there, I got a couple dogs that are going to be in heaven. I got a few didn't make it, I promise you. <laughs> but my, but my, point is, my, my point is this. I got a point. Hallelujah. You're not going to have fear and anxiety and worry. You're not going to be saying, oh, man, I need to get my prescription refilled. Come on, somebody. You're not going to say, oh, I forgot to get to the bank. Oh, I forgot to get my visa payment in. Oh, I've got to get my mortgage paid. I've got to get my, part, my car payment made. Not, oh, did I hear somebody shout about that? Woo. I'm not going to have to get groceries. You go home, come back to your mansion, and the groceries going to be there. And if you don't feel like cooking, it doesn't be cooked for you. My mom taught me about heaven. I'm telling you the true story. She is here instantly in my mom's home and not in a nursing home anymore. I give God praise about that. But my mom would always sing songs. She'd tell me about heaven. My, my, we'd hear heaven, heaven, heaven. And one day, one day, my mom said, honey, talk to you about heaven. Do you have any questions about heaven? And I said, is there going to be macaroni and cheese? So, 
So when you, when you get there, you're going to have macaroni and cheese. It's all going to be on this. It's going to be ready. It's gonna, not going to be that stuffy box with a little powder. It's going to be real cheese and melted, and it's going to be yummy. And it's going to put a big fork in. It's going to string down, catch the rest of it. Hallelujah. And then you're going to have pecan pie. You're going to have uh, 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 molten lava and chocolate cake. And, no, and you're not going to gain one inch, one ounce. You're just going to eat like it's going out of style. You're going to put all four hooves up in the trough. Hallelujah. I'm just telling you, we can be excited. Somebody give the Lord a praise. He's preparing a mansion for us, a feast for us. But if there were no mansions and if there were no macaroni and cheese and if there were no wonderful gifts and if there were no lion and lamb laying down and if there was no river of life and there were no gates of pearl and there were no beautiful streets of gold, what will make heaven real is that Jesus will be there and we can be with him and where he is there is peace, there's not worry, there's not fear, there's not dread for he is the prince of peace and he'll give your life peace forever and we will reign with him forever in peace. So the enemy, the enemy that comes against you, don't feel bad about it because, you know, one of the greatest prophets of all time, Elijah, he, he destroyed 450 prophets of Baal. He called down fire from heaven. He was taken up in heaven in a whirlwind in a chariot of fire. He was one of the greatest prophets of all time. He was the most talked about. He's talked about over and over in all the New Testament, the Old Testament, Elijah, Elijah, Elijah. He was awesome. He gave Elisha the double portion. Let me tell you something about Elijah. He knows what it's like because he sat under the juniper tree one day after a great victory. And he was weary and he was tired and he was fatigued and he was wore out. And he just said, oh, God, that I would die. He had suicidal thoughts. He had tendencies to be depressed. One of the greatest men of all time. I'm going to promise you, some of you have fought such horrible battles. You, and some of us in our makeups, we have different personality types, different, different kinds of things going on in our system. So there are some people, they will never be really prone to that. They don't get discouraged. They, they may get discouraged a little bit, but they can shake it off really easy. They can shake it off real fast. How many of you, even when you get discouraged, you can get over it real quick? Raise your hand. See, I'm very jealous of all of you. Because it's hard. Sometimes I'm not the best on getting over stuff. Anybody raise your hand? I agree with that, Pastor. I'm not the not me getting over stuff, but you getting over stuff. Let me make this very clear: that if this man of God can face that, you and I can face it. Which some of you have been through so much, you would just only be human if you don't get low once in a while. I'm preaching good this morning. I'm telling you, I ain't preached for a while, and I feel like I feel like I got a Holy Ghost anointing on me. I'm about to bring the thunder and the passion and the fire to announce to you that this Canaanite spirit can go and must go and will go. And you don't have to live low and discouraged and defeated. You don't have to be despondent. You can have victory in Jesus' name. Good to give the Lord a shout of praise about that reality. It's a truth. So you should drive out the Canaanites. You should utterly destroy them. You will not make marriage with them. This is why I said, listen to me, church. When you are a Christian, you know, I have, I have preached this. Is everybody listening real good? Anybody not listening, just put your hand up. Anybody not listening? You're in la-la land. You're zoning out. you got more important things to think about. Come on, wait, lift your hand. That's fine. I won't call you out. Now, here's the reality, though. I have preached this umpteen hundreds of times but I'm telling you if you are a Christian and you start having feelings toward a non-Christian that is the devil four amens and one of them was my refreshed wife I said if you start having feelings and you start wanting to have a relationship with a non-Christian that is not Jesus that is the devil that's not the amen I was hoping for but I'll, I'll accept that for now. I said, that is not Jesus. Do you believe that? Maybe you don't believe it. Maybe you think it's just fine to hook up with somebody that doesn't love your Jesus. Maybe you think it's great. Yeah, oh, Jesus died on the cross for me. Forgive me of all my sins. But, you know, they haven't got to that yet, and that's not a big deal. Maybe Jesus isn't a big deal. But for me, he's not only a big deal, he's the big deal. And if you're not a child of Jesus, you're not a child of God, I'm just, I'm just going to recommend that you give your heart to the Lord today and let Jesus put the right person in your life. And I will promise you that if I, if I was going to be real and we were keeping it real today, 
I could ask people to raise their hands. If you know when you were a Christian, you got into a, a relationship that was not unequal, was unequally yoked, and it caused you nothing but a heartache and pain, you know you could testify to everyone watching that that is a reality. You wish you hadn't done that. Now am I telling the truth? This is not a new development. This is not news. This is not a news flash. God always said, if you are my people, you will marry within your people. You will date within your people. They didn't have dating, but they had courtship. They had assigned marriages. And you were not to go into the enemy's camp. You were not, you were not to make an alliance with the enemy. You were not to let them date. Because what, what, what do we read? Well, because they will turn your children against me. Let me make this clear. When you have a Christian and a sinner dating, it's been my experience, and you can't argue with my experience. You can debate and take a position on all kinds of things all day long, but you can't take a position on my experience because my experience is my experience. But it's been my experience of pastoring full-time for over 30 years that 90% of the time, probably 99% of the time, when a Christian and a sinner start having a relationship, the sinner usually wins and gets them over in their camp easier than the Christian gets a sinner in their camp. Well, I'm just telling you, I come on vacation to deal with some things. I want to deal with some things. And I know, listen, just like, just like when Abraham had to take uh, Hagar and Ishmael and send them on their way, his heart was breaking. It was the child of flesh. God said, don't make provision for them. Get rid of the child of the flesh, uh, Ishmael, because he came and he was mocking the child of the spirit, Isaac. And God said, you've got to send them packing. Let me make this very clear. I know it's not easy. I know they're real people. And I know I've made more enemies over this almost than anything else. You know, and I made enemies over a few other things, but this has been a big one. Because people say, y'all don't, you can't tell me, you can't. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you, but I'm trying to plead with you and beg you. It's not going to be worth it. I don't care what they bring to the table. If they have not come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and they're not prepared to go to heaven, they really have nothing to add to you your life. They will distract from your life. They will detour from your life. They will detract from your life. And I know you like them and I know they're cute and I know they're suave and I know they got all the game going on and I know they're, you know, they, they really, they really, really can be a nice person. I understand all that. I understand all that. I know they're real people, but I will promise you, you will do yourself a favor by saying, here's the plan. I'm not going to hook up with you. I'm going to serve Jesus. I recommend a great church to you. You go find Jesus. You serve him for a year or so because how are you going to know if they're serving him for you or if they're serving him for him come church me serve Jesus oh, I've heard that I've heard that I didn't plan on staying on this but I'm going to stay on it that's fine I'm going to stay on it pastor go ahead stay on it pastor <clears throat> and um, and they come church and you know oh they're serving God so God pastor you're married she is but I'm telling you they get married or they get they get their claws in too tight and they go back to their real colors it's got to be a work of the heart. You don't get saved because you want to date somebody. You get saved because you are going to hell. You don't get saved because the pastor said, unless you get saved, I can't date you. Well, I know he's a big guy, so I better just obey him. I really don't want to. You get saved because you are going to hell. That's why you get saved. That's called missionary dating. And we don't promote that. Oh, I'm just making you. How, how many do I still have three friends? Yay, three. I'm challenging you, young people. Teenagers, moms and dads, I promise you, people come up and say, Pastor, I'm telling you about my first, I'm telling you about my girlfriend, I'm telling you about my boyfriend. You know, I have a question, and I've asked it to 100 before you, and you're going to get it too. It's always the first question. It's always the first question. It's in my heart, because I'm a Jesus man. I don't care how rich they are, I don't care how popular they are, I don't care if they're the all-star team, it doesn't matter how cute they are, how much money they are, how many friends they are, how popular, how many friends on Facebook, none of that stuff matters, that's all a bunch of hooey in my regard. What matters to me is, are they a Christian? Now watch this. If your answer is anything but a very quick, sudden yes, they're not. If it's I don't know, they're not. If, it has, if it's we haven't talked about it yet, they're not. Woo, I can tell you missed me. You have no business in the enemy's camp 
because you're saying God's not big enough to find someone for you in his camp. So you got to go search out for yourself because God can't handle that for you. God, you're big enough to save me, big enough to take me to heaven, but I can't trust you to find me the mate. I can't trust you to find me the right one for my life. I got to go find that myself. I got to search myself. I got to look up. I got to get all that ready for myself. God, you just can't do that for myself. I'm just going to get off this any minute, but I'm not, it's not going to be real fast. I'm just telling you that you got these alliances that are entangling your life. And you are confused and you are hurt and you are torn right in the middle. God is pulling you this way and they're pulling you that way. And you want to you want to serve God, but you love them and you fall in love with them and you've been intimate with them and all of these things have been happening. And let me and I just don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't know what I'm gonna do. If you would have listened to the word of God to begin with, you'd have saved yourself. Is that good preaching a lot of heartache? How many of you wish? Look, I've only got six more of these to go. Hallelujah. But how many of you wish, how many of you wish you had listened to the Word of God, the man of God, the house of God a long time ago, or you saved yourself a whole world of heartache? Would you stand to your feet and give the Lord a praise? If you know I'm telling you the truth, you'd have saved, you spared yourself. You spared yourself a lot of mess, a lot of mess, a whole lot of hurt. Okay, now watch this. Then if you realize that, then we better keep a young man called Pastor Josh filled with buses. And we better keep a young man named Pastor Dylan filled with that amp. And we better keep these young kids coming in by the scores. And we better tell them while they're young, you don't have to compromise. You don't have to be cheap. You don't have to trade yourself away. You don't have to give yourself to something that's not Jesus because Jesus is bigger than all of the things. We sang in a moment ago, Jesus, you're the only one who can satisfy. Sex won't satisfy. Relationships won't satisfy. Uh, popularity won't satisfy. Intimacy won't satisfy. Nothing will satisfy like Jesus can satisfy. And we need to preach it hard and we need to preach it long. And we need to say, don't make the same mistakes I have made. So if you stood and you got a young person in your life, a niece, a nephew, a grandchild, a child, a neighborhood kid, if you stood and you said, I messed up when I was a young kid and it's, I've been paying the price and picking up the tab every day since my, in my adult years. It's been years ago, but I'm still reminded on a constant basis, I wish I hadn't done that. Then who are you to let those children go and, pi and, and pick and find their own way in life? They've got to be led. They've got to be trained. They've got to be taught. They've got to be corralled they've got to be taught they've got to be shown they've got to be shown how to live right we can't let them go their own devices or they're going to sin like you sin and i sin we got to trust god with them hallelujah now there's a free list available anytime you need it and i'm not being cute i'm not being funny but kathy and i have a list of questions to ask your children and if you need that we'll give that to you it's like where are you where are you going how long are you gonna be who are you gonna be with are they Christians do they cuss do they smoke do they drink are they fools listen you say well that's the only friends they got they, they're not friends they may be people they hang out with and laugh with and have I had those friends we hung out with, we laughed, but I ended up compromising myself. I ended up saying things I shouldn't have said. I ended up lying and acting like I wanted to act like them and act like them. And then I, lived, I went home and I felt guilty and I felt bad. I behaved wrongly. I wasn't true to myself. I wasn't true to my family. I wasn't true to my church. I wasn't true to Jesus. And it wasn't worth the guilt. Am I preaching to somebody who knows I'm talking about beside me? It wasn't worth the guilt. See, that old Canaanite spirit comes in, and you get low, and you get down, and you get defeated, and you don't have the strength to stand. But that's why you're a lighthouse today, because we're going to infuse you, we're going to encourage you, and we're going to tell you that God's on your side, and you can prevail, and you can win, and you will conquer. Every, every, every young girl hear me, every young boy hear me, every mom hear me today, every father hear me today. I know the devil's coming. He does not play games. He is for real. The devil plays for keeps. There's no scrimmaging. There's no practicing. When he 
plays every time, it's Super Bowl for the devil. And that's why we can't tinker around. That's why we can't mess around. we got to be armed with the whole armor of God. And we, from head to toe, got to be ready for battle and got to be ready to smite down that enemy and drive out that enemy in Jesus' name. Now, I want to say something to every parent, everyone influencing children today. They absolutely desperately need us while on vacation. Now, I'm going to say a couple things next week, maybe have some pictures of some, some law oh, God taught us some real lessons on some things. And I'm just going to tell you, you need to be here next Sunday. I got, I got a, something to really burden in my spirit. But, uh, but I, was, I was walking out the store, and I saw these kids hanging out, and they couldn't have been, they couldn't have been past Dylan, 9 or 10. They couldn't have been 9 or 10. But they had the most awfulest, hateful uh, language, <clears throat> cursing in every foul word, every demonic attitude and four or five of these kids were standing there they were the verbiage the language it made my spirit cringe it's bad enough when adults act that way but and and what was amazing is that they were spewing out this foul cursing and every damnable thing you can imagine every foul word that Hollywood puts in their movies and makes them think it's cool to use that. Why are we letting Hollywood? I don't know why we let them run our world because I've been there. It's not Hollywood. It's Holly weird. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why. I got some things I'm going to talk to you about today. I had some things on my mind. I had some things I got to deal with. God said, deal with them. And I love you enough to do that. I love, and what cringed me was these kids let that stuff, and it didn't phase them at all. They were minding their business. They were roller skating or, I mean, skateboarding, and they were just being fun. They, but they, they, this, they, were, they could not have been that big. And I'm telling you, I said, oh, God. Oh, God, it wasn't those kids that I was angry at. It was those parents. Where are moms? Where's our dads? They're going to say, we're not acting that way. We are, we're not, not going to live that way. And listen, Lighthouse family, you and I, I can't do much about those poor kids in Florida other than pray for them. But I can do something about these kids in Richmond. And I can do something. And you and I can do something about these kids at Lighthouse. And we need to love them enough. I'm not talking about yelling and scolding and, and defrauding them and defaming them and embarrassing them and belittling them. That does no good. I'm talking about saying to them, as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate my life. If you live your life like I live my life, you'll be happy and you'll be blessed. I'm talking about setting an example. And they're going to live like you live and act like you act and read what you read and talk what you talk. And they're going to give like you give. They are looking for somebody. Somebody show me how to live life. So, 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 so. Welcome home, Pastor. The Hittites. Enemy number two. Here's what their name means. The Hittites are long wiped off the map, but their spirit is still here. Their name means fear, oppression, sickness, and poverty. Kevin, did anyone pick on you and use you as an example while I was gone? You feel left out, don't you? But how many, I'm going to illustrate something to you. Kevin Cole, sit on the altar for a minute, right up here, right front and center, right in front of the pulpit there. Now listen to me. That's, Kevin represents you, and I represent fear. I represent sickness, and I represent poverty. Now let me tell you something about poverty. Poverty, I'm praying so hard for some of you, because the reason you're poor is because you've always been poor. That's it. You can't think of any other reason that you should remain poor. And I can't, and I'm not trying to tell you that you're a sinner because you're poor. There's nothing righteous about having money. That's not, that's not, makes you holy. That's not it. But some of you, the problem is when you're in your poverty or when you're broke or all the time beat down financially, you cannot, you cannot give to the work of God. And that's why we get finances. The wealth of the righteous is laid up in the hands of the wicked. God is bringing a pipeline to you and me, not just to get more money and buy better stuff, but that we can be a blessing. 
And if all I ever have is barely enough, who can I, who can I make an impact in? And I, <clears throat> I care so much about you to say that you've got this spirit, this enemy attacking you, and you need to take purposeful steps if it's going to get in classes, if it's going back to school, if it's making the right connections, if it's improving yourself, if it's working harder, if whatever it takes and giving more, just, I mean, it's just saying, you're going to continue that way. And sickness and poverty and fear, God didn't give us the spirit of fear. Now watch this. So I'm representing the Hittite spirit. I'm representing fear. I'm representing Sickness and poverty. And this is poor little Kevin. Kevin, I don't know if I've ever oppressed you, but you are about to be oppressed. Lucky Kevin. <laughs> Can you put your legs together just a little bit? A little bit more? Okay, make it easy on me. He's bracing. <laughs> but some of you are trying to live life and pray and praise, and all you got is oppression on you. Lord have mercy. <laughs> okay, I'm done. He's singing, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. It's not fun being oppressed, is it? My leg hurts. <laughs> My leg hurts too. I hurt myself oppressing you. And how much, how much traction, how much traction is Kevin gonna get? How much mobility? How, how, how many steps forward and forward and only forward is he going to take? How, how much can he give? How much can he bless? How much can he praise? How much can he be faithful if a big old blob of oppression <laughs> did you did you get it or do I illustrate it again, do it again, do it again. thank you Kevin this uh, your friends over here saying one more time <laughs> am I talking to you listen to me that is a spirit oppression Oppression weighs you down. Oppression comes on top of you. Oppression immobilizes. It makes it dark. It makes it heavy. You're weighted. You cannot go forward. You cannot progress. You cannot be happy. You cannot grow. Some of you aren't growing. I'll be honest with you. You're not really growing. I see other people stepping up. You're getting more joy. You're getting more victory in your life. God is using you, and you're just saying, I'm going to new heights. And some of you are just stagnant, and you're stale. You're not growing. That doesn't mean you're bad. That doesn't mean anybody's mad at you. It doesn't mean I'm down on you. That's not it at all. It just simply means you got a spirit of the Hittite world on you. And we need to drive it out. Whew. Give the Lord a praise as you jump to your feet. Amen. Woo! Huh. Oh, we got a better praise than that. Give the Lord a praise as you... Get to your feet. Now listen closely to me. I'm going to call out some words. I can't hesitate about this. Talked about the church we was at last week. The pastor called folks forward. I heard him say, I'm not asking twice. Again, where'd he get that? I don't know. But there's something about... A decisive quick move in sports the most important step is the first step he's got a fast first step he's got a strong first step that means he's got a chance to win you run a race and you're out of the blocks slow you may not catch up I don't want you to get out of the blocks slow when I call these out to you and this is going on in your life I want you to get out of the blocks get out of your seat step quickly for your deliverance has come. And I'm not going to mess with it today. I'm telling you. You're, I'm commanding those things to leave your life. I'm telling you. I believe there's victory. God didn't send us on this respite. He didn't send us on this time. That we could come back and just stay the same. Did he? Come on now. 
Let's, before we ask any questions, throw your hands up across this place with all your heart and commit to obedience. Commit to listening to God. Father God, now in the name above all names, in the mighty name of Jesus, I will prevail. I will conquer. I will win. Ha, ha, hallelujah. 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 Oh God. Oh God. Deliver people. Set them free. Give them clarity in their heart that you're moving, you're working, you're answering in the name of Jesus. These enemies, let me read it again. While they are stronger and while they are mightier than you, just realize on your own you can't beat them. And the Lord will deliver them out from over you and you will conquer them. And you will utterly destroy them. And you will deal with them and you'll break them down. For God has chosen you to be a people, a special treasure above all peoples on the face of the earth. I know I'm prejudiced. I know, I know you got to understand this, but I think Lighthouse is filled with very special chosen choice people. And you and I have no business trying to cohabitate and be neighbors with these enemies. That land is not their land. That promise is not their promise. It's my promise. And I will drive them out. Watch this. If you are bowed down or depressed, step out as fast as you can. If you are in low places, step out as fast as you can. If you are at a low point in your life, get out of that block. I feel the Holy Ghost rise and rise, Holy Spirit. Rise, Holy Spirit, the living God. Come, come, come now. Come now, Holy Spirit. Let's just take a moment, lift your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Hallelujah. God is going to win the victory for us today. God's going to win the victory for us today. Some of you are still fighting. It may not, it may not be clinical depression, but you're fighting spiritual depression. You're depressed over an area of your life and you haven't come. I'm telling you, please, merge and you come. Your heart may be breaking. You need to be down here. Come. Your heart is breaking and you need to be down here. Come. We're waiting. You're worth the wait. God loves you. God loves you. You're completely discouraged in your life. Come. If you're facing discouragement, come right now. If you're facing discouragement, come. Come to this altar. Move. Yes. 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 I tell you, when you stepped out, the devil got real nervous. He's losing stronghold. He's losing his grip on you. He got real, real nervous. You're depressed. You're discouraged. You're despondent. Come. My God is in this house. Woo!